started, Daniel. What do you think? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, today joined by our friends at Climber uh, for for a session on from insights to action, and we're going to talk about how to future-proof your decisions with intuitive analytics. I'm going to talk a little bit about forecasting, and uh, when Daniel and I were starting to uh, create this webinar, I think you will all uh, all uh, you know appreciate this. Things were a little different a month or two ago than they are today, so. We're going to pivot for some of these uh, discussions, and I think uh, this could be a really interesting topic uh, across your organization. So I am Joe Warbington. I'm the Industry Solutions Director at VizLib. Recently uh, became a click luminary as well at the beginning of the year, so really proud uh, to be part of that community and and uh, you know share in some of the discussions uh, with a, a great batch of people across the uh, ecosystem. And uh, you know, I've been building apps for, I don't know, close to 10 years now, uh, over 10, I guess, if I look at my own screen, and uh, have a lot of fun creating these different use cases and putting the technology in the hands of more people and helping them to understand how their data uh, can speak. And I uh, definitely have a passion for uh, connecting people, and I've been doing a lot of that lately uh, with the COVID-19 uh, situation across the globe. So, uh, you know, happy to be here. And uh, the star of the show, uh, Daniel is gonna have a little bit. But I wanna tell you a little bit about VizLib, if this is your first time too. We are, uh, we're growing very quickly. Uh, I joined just six months ago and we were at 30 something employees. Uh, I think it was 33 when I joined. And we're, we're well over 60 now, uh, covering all of the verticals. Um, and we, we are technology partner with Click. We build value added products for ClickSense. And these products allow you to do some amazing things and supercharge your applications where you can add new visuals, new capabilities. You can take self-service to new levels and bring data to more people. Um, or maybe uh, uh, with our finance report, you can have a P&L or balance sheet on steroids um, and drive new processes. And our two newest products, the Gantt and Collaboration, allow you to bring more people into the fold and share insights across your organization. So uh, when we get to our section, and, and Daniel will have some of these products in his examples as well, um, I'll touch on a few of these uh, to just give you a, a taster of what we can do with VizLib. So uh, joined by Daniel from Climber, he's a BI manager in AI Wiz. Uh, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, Daniel? Uh, yeah, hi, Joanne, everyone, and um, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Gray Stockholm. Um, Maybe a bit of a bad weather isn't too bad nowadays if it keeps people indoors and safe and not needing other people. Um, so I work at Climber, um, and my role here is BI manager. It means that I'm it means that I'm account manager and project manager, and I'm also heading uh, our advanced analytics push that we're doing right now. Um, and some of you may be familiar with Climber uh, and what we do. Uh, we are a consulting company focusing on click and click byproducts, um, and we have offices in the Nordics, in UK, and in the Netherlands. And uh, some of you might be familiar with our uh, Climber extensions, or what used to be the Climber extensions. Uh, since uh, last year, uh, the Climber extensions are now a part of Vizlib after uh, the merger acquisition between Climber extensions and Vizlib. So. I'll be back in just a minute to talk to you about um, a customer app that we've built, showcasing some things about visual analytics, planning, and advanced analytics. So I'll be right back. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Good to see you. Uh, so real quick, uh, kind of what we're hoping to cover today with you all and really get into uh, an application very quickly here is Daniel's example of uh, a hospitality solution that uses forecasting. And we'll get into the ins and outs of that. Um, and I'll cover in the second section how you can build this really quickly with VizLib and ClickSense. Uh, I want to take you through a couple examples too that are outside of the hospitality space just to show you what's possible. And then we'll have a little discussion. And I think we'll, we'll get into some of the nuances and considerations all of you might have these days with um, predictive analytics and forecasting and how things are ever changing, uh, especially in our current situation. And then we'll we'll have a, a, a good chunk of time available for live Q&A where you all can post questions 
um, and we'll uh, we'll figure out if Daniel or I will take the questions uh, as they come in towards the end. So I'm going to hand the presenter rights over to Daniel for him to share his screen. And I'm going to turn off my camera as well so everybody gets full screen mode. Uh, yeah, so hope everyone sees my screen. Um, please raise your hand if you don't, or um, maybe I can get some help in um, figuring that out. Looks good to me. So, yeah. So what I'm presenting here today is um, a real customer case. Um, the customer itself uh, chooses to be anonymous for this case, um, but it's a chain of hotels and restaurants. Um, and we started working with them last year because the leadership team really wanted to have an overview of their business. Um, they wanted to see what was going on. They were a bit tied up with data in different systems, uh, and they wanted to, you know, show show more of, of their business. Uh, luckily, the leadership team were also really into visual analytics, and when we presented the different cases and, and different ideas that we had to them, they really were happy to see that you could do a lot by clicking and visually analyzing. So I'll walk you through a few things that we did here um, and how we were supported by the Bislib tools uh, to make that happen. Um, but I'd like to start off with, you know, just mentioning the current situation. Of course, six months ago in the hotel and restaurant business is very different from the last couple of weeks or months. Um, and I mean, if, if understanding your data and your business was important then, now it's really critical for survival. So I think from what I've heard, um, the usage that they have in the app has really gone up. Um, the way they look at data and, and use it to plan day by day has really dramatically changed. So um, what we see here is a quick overview of the most important KPIs uh, that they use in this hotel restaurant chain. Um, obviously, a few KPIs regarding occupancy, uh, staff cost per hotel night, and some industry-specific uh, KPIs, KPIs such as RevPAR or revenue per available room. And in many cases, um, a user who's never seen anything uh, in a dashboard format or haven't, hasn't experienced click before um, is really blown away by, by just being able to click anything, uh, look at what they want, and make selections that reflect everywhere. So starting from the top, you know, simply being able to see what happened on every Monday during this quarter? Or seeing how does it look on Mondays for this specific uh, hotel or restaurant? Or being able to switch between different currencies just one click away. I mean, for many users, just being able to do that does a lot of what they want to see. But we wanted to stay a bit more on the uh, visual analytics part of things. And here we also got a lot of help from uh, the Bislib extensions. For example, uh, the simple KPI. So many of you are probably aware of the standard KPIs and what they can do. But with the help of the Bislib KPI, we can really show a whole story of our data. So if you look at the occupancy rate um, for all hotels, or if we drill down to this specific hotel, we see that the occupancy for Q1 19 is around 60%. Uh, compared to last year, it's almost uh, the same, but week by week compared to last year, it varies up and down. So just by adding this simple KPI, it can tell the whole story around uh, occupancy week by week compared to last year, and if it's good or bad, in just these few squares. And going forward, um, I mean, everything doesn't have to be super visual. Uh, I still believe that many things can be accomplished with standard bar charts, standard scatter plots, et cetera, et cetera. But we really tried hard to find the right visualizations to showcase uh, the most important things uh, for the customer. And I'd like to share with you a, a small story about this specific chart. Uh, it's called a Venn diagram, and it's a part of the Bislib library. And when we first had our initial discussions with, with the customer and the CFO and the leadership team, um, before our big presentation, they told us that they spent half the night before trying to analyze um, what kind of 
products that their customer buy, customers buy in their restaurants. Um, they want to make sure that people who eat pizza in their upscale pizza restaurants, they also buy a beer or a glass of wine with a pizza. Um, they're not particularly fond of people only coming there to only drink beer or only drink pizza because this is upscale restaurants, they have high rents and they want to make sure that their average ticket is, is high. So they spent half of last night um, looking through uh, individual tickets from the ticket system, trying to count how many have you know, eaten and had drinks uh, together. Um, as a sort of coincidence, the very next day, we came with the Venn diagram and showed them that for this selection of uh, for the sample selection, we had uh, a number of pizza tickets, a number of drinks tickets, but also a number of drinks and pizza tickets. So they really used this information to be able to drill down and go further into what kind of what kind of tickets and what kind of customers do they have. So I let's love do that. that. Story, yeah, it's. Um... You just change their lives, right? So maybe they'll still be spending nights <laughs> drinking beer and eating pizza, but they don't have to go through all those receipts to figure out this stuff the next round. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say that we have our 79 sample tickets with pizza and drinks. What can we say about those? Well, so I'm trying to figure out what's. Moment. We'll see if we have a technical issue here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So by drilling down into pizzas and drinks, we can switch to the next level. So instead of just looking at the main types, we can continue already to see, okay, so maybe we're pushing pizza and bottled beers. Uh, what kind of combinations do we have? And we teach our servers to recommend specific beers for specific pizzas, what have people bought before, and, and what do we do with this information? So let's continue. Uh, let's look at bottled beers and the 22 sample tickets for that. And now we can go down to the individual product. And well, this is a bit bubbly and a bit much information, but we do see some trends here. For example, we have the margarita pizza and the, we have the Poretti beer and there seems to be a fairly large overlap between margarita and Poretti. Uh, we also have the prosciutto pizza and the IPA beer and a fairly large overlap between those. So there seems to be some kind of different taste profiles with margarita eaters drinking Poretti beers and prosciutto uh, eaters drinking IPA beers. Um, and maybe that could be inspiration for you know, having recommendations, uh, showing more information and taking that one step further. So this is one really fun example um, of how a simple visualization um, can really change the way they work and change the way they think. And the next level of this, uh, of course, would be to look further into what times of day do we have certain trends, uh, where do we see trends that uh, are different from, from place to place, etc. So that's a few comments on how to use um, extensions and more innovative uh, visualizations to, to plan and to understand your business better. Um, then we have another thing that's really important for uh, the hospitality industry and of course every other industry as well. And that's the thing of planning and understanding and visually analyzing uh, staff costs and, um, and, and worked hours. Of course, uh, for hotels, um, staff cost is a big part of, of their cost structure. And as you can see, around one third to half of the revenue for hotels is taken up by uh, staff costs. So one of the things that we did was drilled down a bit deeper into employee analysis. How do we plan? How do we understand? What can we say about you know, how, we, how we plan our staffing? And the ideas here are similar. We're looking at the various KPIs that are important for 
this company. Just a quick overview of the work hours, how many full-time employees do we have, um, what's the total staff cost, and what's the staff cost per hour. And I mean, here we have again the, the power of click, being able to combine information from different systems and different sources and put them together, clickable, interactive, and analyzable. And of course, we do have a, a fairly uh, typical hospitality trend and hospitality uh, view here. So here we see the number of hours worked per day and per week. And I selected one of the hotels here. Uh, and I think this is more of a business type hotel. So they have their main customers and driven by that, the worked hours from Tuesdays to Thursdays, where Sundays and Saturdays are fairly slow. And in my sample data here, we have uh, worked hours and, and staffing until the last of March last year. And then the question is, what do we do on the 1st of April? What do we do for the next week? Um, how much staff should we plan for? Who should work in which department? Uh, and, and where do we plan our hours? Because we can see from the previous um, uh, historical trends that we do have worked hours, and we have the historically scheduled hours, and there seems to be a mismatch between how they work and how they schedule. It seems like their scheduling is not really up to par. So what can we do to visually, or uh, with advanced analytics, help out with um, staff planning and forecasting and scheduling? Well, we do know some things. Um, Tuesdays through Thursdays are busier. Um, we can see that, you know, just looking at the previous weeks, for example, uh, we have the same trend for the last week. It's the dark purple bar, the average of the last four weeks, we have the light purple bar, and average of the last six weeks, we have the gray bar. So here we do see some information, but I'm not sure that this is enough to be able to, you know, put the schedule down for the coming week. Of course, some departments are more easily uh, to plan than others. If we look at the reception, it's fairly constant week to week. However, if we instead look at the uh, restaurant related uh, departments, dining room, kitchen, breakfast, the dishes, we can see that some weeks are you know, easier than others, and we can't really just by looking at this reliably plan um, the coming week's uh, schedule. So what we then activated was the forecasting function that's built into the basically blind chart. And we looked at the data and then we realized that, okay, this is actually a really good candidate for activating forecasting on, because we do have a trend, uh, you know, it goes up or it goes down. And more importantly, the data is very seasonal. So over the week, we do have some fluctuations and we could use them in forecasting to, to say something about the next week. So here we have the example of that. And on a total level, planned on these dining related departments, we do get uh, a forecast uh, automatically from the basically blind chart. So here you can see that our background is a bit complex to, um, to forecast on. And as you can see, one week on Sunday, we have this trend. Another week, we have this trend. So maybe we should try to select something that looks a bit more uh, reliable, where we can try to say something, uh, something more. Well, here we have it, or let's do like this. We'll switch even to the uh, to the reception Jump here and then click more and work the reception. So for the last weeks, we can see that we have uh, a fairly repeating pattern, uh, not every week, and sometimes we have uh, peaks and sometimes we have valleys. Um, but even based on this, we can get a suggestion for the next weeks uh, uh, scheduled of hours. 
So Monday, April 1st, 28 hours according to this model, Tuesday, 33 hours, Wednesday, 34 hours. But you also see that we get these um, uh, confidence intervals where we can uh, get some measure of the certainty or uncertainty in this, uh, in this forecast. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, or if we would like to see a total of several departments, we also included a forecast for the upcoming seven days for, let's say, the top three departments. And we get an idea here of the total volume that we could forecast. So for this customer, uh, and in this use case, we really try to maximize what we could do using visual analytics um, and predictive forecasting um, to give some kind of idea and to help the people uh, to plan their business. Um, so that's the main things I'm talking about. And um, I think what's really helped uh, this company is, is you know, the option to have this whole toolbox of Vislib uh, extensions. So you can select what works best for each given situation. It doesn't mean that we always have to use the fanciest chart or the fanciest um, extension, but we can if we want to. And for the right problem, we can find the right solution. Wonderful. And th this is something that, um, you know, you're, you work with clients to roll these types of solutions out across their organization. So is uh, kind of, you guys have these in different industries as well, right? You mentioned healthcare, um, hospitality, and a few others. So climbers coming to the table with some somewhat pre-built solutions here? Um, yes, and more importantly, we have the experience from different industries and we can draw the conclusions you know, to find similarities across them. So what's applicable for hospitality, hotels and restaurants is sometimes very similar to what we see in for example, retail. Uh, or if you look at healthcare and staffing here. So in some senses, staffing is staffing. In yep. other senses, you know, it's more industry specific. Perfect. Okay, so let's see, uh, really before we uh, pivot over to what I have, any questions that came in specifically for this hospitality solution? I do see one, um, the accuracy of the predictions. Um, I think we'll definitely be talking about that um, throughout the rest of the session too, as this is the top of mind. I, I was on a, uh, a webinar the other day and they said, we're basically going to have to throw out all of our models um, and there are legit reasons for that, but there's still going to be the data that we can use going forward. Um, so I think we'll, we'll save that one and talk about it in a little bit. Um, but somebody was asking about what is this, the circle chart with hours by day and week? Uh, it's the heat map, right, in the lower left. Do you want yeah, to talk to that right. real quick? The, the Vizna heat map. So what I think is appealing with this chart is well, first of all, it's a heat map, uh, which I found very, very nice. Um, also, with Vislib, we get these, um, what do you call them? Um, the lines and the pointers to show us really where we are and, and to have an idea. And especially, I'm a big fan of how we select in this heat map, so we can just draw a line for all Tuesdays to th through Saturdays in week, oops, sorry, from week four to week 10. Mm -hmm. Go down there. So, so this is my life. things to kick around in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, then one more real quick here is how do you switch between 14-day forecast and seven-day forecast by department? Mm -hmm. I think they're so, um, curious how you have a container inside of your screen. Exactly. So this is a Vizlib container. And behind the scenes, I have a master item for the seven day forecast chart and a master item for the 14 day forecast chart. And I simply switch between them by clicking here. Um, perhaps I hope that answers the question. Um, otherwise, building a 14 day forecast or a seven day forecast is, uh, as Joe will show you, 
a setting on the chart itself. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to share my screen here again. Let me know. Um, the slide should come back up. Should be good. And I'm going to share uh, my browser here. Make sure that comes across first for folks. Look good? Okay, so uh, the, the starting point for a lot of people is going to be at bizlib.com, where you can find our different products. You can start a trial for free for five users, put it in your environment, and start playing around with uh, any of the things that Daniel's showing you today and a few of the things that I hope to get into. Um, so just orient yourself with our website. Lots of great resources here too, where we walk you through why you would want to use certain visualizations over others, or you can join our community uh, to learn more about um, the different ins and outs of different solutions that we have and what our products can do. But I wanted to take uh, a line chart and show you how we add the forecast in with something that uh, maybe many of us have been doing lately, which is binge watching Netflix and I'm sure we all have our, our favorite guilty pleasures here. I put this data together, uh, found it from a, a data source called Kaggle that gives us information about movies that Netflix has been creating, but not only movies, but the TV shows. And I think you've seen over time, uh, Netflix has gotten into a production mode where they create a number of movies, but they've also been very successful with new TV series. And so their TV shows started to just jump up so that people have more binge binge worthy things to watch and i wanted to know you know this data ended right at 2020 how can we try to figure out how many movies or tv shows netflix will create and this is where um, the first step is maybe just adding a trend line so we're going to hit edit here and uh, we're using the vislib line chart which gives us a, a lot of interesting features to customize the look and feel. And so if I grab this movies timeline, which we put in blue here, um, which represents now about a third of, uh, um, or I'm sorry, I had it backwards there. The movies represent about two thirds of everything. We are going to turn on a trend line. So if I scroll through all the options that we have, um, we will see a section to just click trend lines. And we can pick a linear regression, power, exponential, polynomial. But right there we see, yeah, movies are on the up and up. We can do the same thing, obviously, for TV shows. And when you get trends like this, this can help you to look into the future a little bit. You pull your ruler out, right? Uh, everybody has one of those on their desk. Put it on your screen and kind of measure out and then try to figure out where you're at on this line. They're going to have maybe 150 movies out sometime in, in 2020. That's a, that's a way to do some forecasting by hand, but let's turn on um, forecasting with the visible line chart. What you'll see is we don't require R or Python or SAS to be set up behind the scenes. There's no server side extensions configuration needed. We just give you the ability to turn on advanced analytics. In this case, we'll calculate a forecast. As soon as I put this in, you'll see that uh, the line chart is now forecasted out. We drop a nice little annotation here and give you that forecast that Daniel was showing. And um, we give you the ability to choose the range, kind of the, define the period, how far back you want to train this particular model on the historical data, and then how far forward you want to forecast. The model behind this is the Holtz winter forecast, which is a really common statistical method. Uh, for doing time series analysis. And, you know, I'm not a data scientist, don't purport to be, but these are things that uh, you're going to see and have seen in a lot of uh, uh, models and line charts that have been floating around lately. Um, they do have nuances. If, if we make the period too large and go too far back, you're going to introduce a lot of noise into the model. And that's where we have the confidence levels that get set. And those ranges can also be configured. Um, but we give you a lot of information on how to use this, how to configure it. But without me even pressing any buttons, we get a nice forecast um, that we can hover over and see, you know, by this time, uh, you know, five periods in or five months in, 
Netflix should have 160 movies that they've created and 57 TV shows. This is seasonal data um, and it is going up. So that whole winter forecast that we have is figuring out the fluctuations and the trends and smoothing this curve to give you um, a view of what is potentially going to happen. Um, but I think we all know there are unforeseen events that can happen in the future. Um, and the COVID-19 uh, situation obviously is impacting every business, every individual across the globe. And we expect to see um, spikes happen. Uh, and this will happen further out into the future as well. So these things need to be taken into consideration that if you're going to look over this last period of two to three months, um, and in the future you're going back and looking at it, it, it will affect your forecasting ability. Um, so it's something to take in consideration. But uh, as you, um, as Daniel showed, you can make selections within the application and maybe filter out those particular dates so that you get a uh, kind of gap in your data where you know that there was something going wrong in the case of COVID and use that information to drive a new forecast forward. So what you can get with something like this, I spent a little bit more time just to format some of the things in the line chart. I wanted to add in uh, where I think some annotations like Netflix released a couple of shows, House of Cards was really popular, uh, then had a terrible, terrible ending. Um, and then Arrested Development they acquired and Orange is the New Black was really one of the first new series as well. But I think around the Stranger Things time in 2016, they really hit their stride. And that's why you're starting to see the number of TV shows spike up. Um, and uh, I expect this actually to jump up as production crews have really jumped on the Netflix bandwagon. So this is the type of thing you can do with line charts. And this really paints a much better story uh, for somebody that's going in and viewing information uh, on a time series analysis like this. Uh, so that's a little bit of the forecasting, how you can quickly turn this on and the dials and switches that you'll have. Um, it, there's no additional configuration necessary, as I mentioned, and it's just simply using the Vislib line chart to do this work. But this leads me to the kind of so what. I want to share this information. Um, we want to get that information out to more people. And we've created, uh, as I mentioned, a product called Vislib Collaboration. And collaboration lives inside of your applications. Um, you'll see this little uh, fun little bubble here, which allows me to make comments on the entire sheet of data. And uh, you'll see here our team uh, uses this to have communication across this particular application. So in this case, Martin was saying, hey, Ralph, take a look at this. And when I double click uh, on this particular comment, no, really, I want you to look at this selection. Uh, Martin was making an insight here, and he was sharing this with the team to say, go look at these particular selections that were made and, and how it's being reflected in the data. Uh, but Jonathan came in and said, you know, he wants to have a discussion around this. Um, and then, you know, we can move through and have a threaded conversation around the data. Um, we can see what Giuseppe said here with Mark and even have a threaded reply. Um, so I can come in here and say, like, Mark, you know, why aren't you talking about this? You need to add your comments here and have a, uh, a fun but can be very serious way of talking about the data uh, within your application. Not only commenting on the entire sheet, you can also comment on individual visualizations like we have here with this KPI box. Um, and again, we can have uh, selections that are created. So Michael here was looking at, uh, you know, formerly of Climber, looking at Canada, Central, and International, and his selections are saved here, and people can comment. But I can also go in here, make my own selections, look at these particular uh, sales reps, for instance, in 2014, and I want to send out this, wow, look at the sales margin here. So all live, uh, can add a little, uh, emoji if you want you know or uh, maybe that's not the most appropriate one but we can share it now with folks through email uh, and completely secured uh, kind of recipient list here through slack which is our tool of choice or team so if i choose slack i'm going to send this i'm actually going to attach uh, an image of the data as well 
and in real time, uh, it puts that comment on the data. I'll pull Slack over here, uh, make this full screen so you can kind of see, and it puts it into a particular channel. In this case, uh, it is the collaboration channel. So there is, wow, look at the sales margin here that I just created a few seconds ago. And it provides a really handy link to go back in. So I've now shared that information with my team. I can bring them back into the fold, keep them living within the data, um, instead of taking screenshots and emailing or you know, sending Excel files around. You can keep people having the conversation uh, in their collaboration tool of choice, but bring them right back into uh, the particular application with all of the most relevant data. So this is collaboration, and I think this is one of the best ways you can get people talking about what's going on uh, around the data, have these conversations, and drive new meetings, um, and maybe accelerate the meetings that you're having today, where a lot of people spend time creating PowerPoint slides or exporting data, where we can just have the conversation and walk through the insights that were created. So that's what I had real quick here uh, to share kind of show a little bit of how we do this and how you can share those insights. Let me get back to the slides. Um, well, I had a couple of things that, you know, you and I, Daniel, have been creating apps for a while now and um, wanted to share some of our like quick tips and hacks. What are your, what are your go-to, um, you know, U, UI or UX additions to applications? Um, uh, yeah, good question. I think um, I always try to remember the basics. Um, anytime you're showing some kind of data, or especially when you're looking at an overview, um, the ability to have three things, um, traditionally three things. So one thing is the comparison. So if you have your budget to compare to, or if you have your previous year or a target or something like that, being able to show, you know, in a simple way, where do I stand compared to how I should be standing? That's one thing. Uh, yeah. The next thing is to include some kind of benchmark. How do I compare to my peers? Or how do, let's say, units or departments compare to each other? Who's the top three? Who's the bottom three, et cetera? Um, so comparison, benchmark, and then a trend uh, to show how has it gone yeah. previously and, and where am I headed? So I think if you have those three things covered, then you're fairly good. Uh, I'd also like to add a fourth thing that's becoming available to us now, especially using these predictive things, and that's to say something about how will it go, so some kind of prediction or estimate or, you know, looking into the future based on what I know now, how do I think or what do I think will happen or could happen in the future, so breaking that wall of not just looking at historical data or the actuals trying to, you know, peek into the future, I think that's important. And if you have these tools in your toolbox with good visualizations, easy tools to have a, a quick forecast, I think those all things become much, much easier. Wonderful. Yeah, the, the things that I think about adding, and um, all of us are seeing tremendous amount of uh, dashboards being shared, and visualizations all over the news. And I think maybe some of us cringe when they see some of these things. They just see a big, a big red number, um, and maybe that's you know depending on what you want to do, you can use that to scare a lot of people. It, you know, the number of cases is just uh, this really uh, uh, enormous number. But I always try to say you know and try to with KPIs to put that trend behind it. How is it going? Uh, where is the growth? Because you know, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Having some indicator around that and having some more color just than a big number is really important, I think, so people don't uh, uh, just draw conclusions from just one number and you can't tell where it's headed. Another thing is definitely, once you get to that insight, what do you do with it? I showed collaboration, which I love to use to just pull people back into the insights that are created uh, or that are made, but using things like buttons um, and actions uh, things that you can put into the various visualizations or actually use button as objects to drive a workflow through an application so that they know when we get to this list of um, uh, individuals or organizations, we want to send an email to everybody to remind them to do this thing. Um, in the healthcare world, it would be 
I find a list of patients that meet this criteria uh, that haven't done this thing. We need to remind them to do something. We can send them a message. And having that button to take that next action from the data uh, is really important. Uh, otherwise, we're just we're just creating dashboards and numbers and people glance at it and don't do anything with it. And that drives me crazy uh, that they wouldn't use the information they have in front of them. Um, it, forecasting, we, we touched on this a little bit. Um, how do you think this is gonna kind of work in the future when we go to do forecasts and we have this, whether it's a spike or a big dip in our data because of the current situation? Yeah, really good question, especially nowadays. Um, I, I think it's really important to be mindful of, of what you're looking at and where it comes from. It, it doesn't mean that you have to know the, the whole uh, code or, or the, uh, the ideas behind it, but, but just know what, what it's based on, especially now if you're looking at a, a forecast. And in my examples, I think we based the forecast on the previous eight or 10 weeks of data. And we see that, you know, that is cyclic over the week and there's a trend going somewhere. And if we now see that for the last month or two, the trend has really changed, you know, pointing downwards, maybe we should adjust our learning uh, data set. So we only look at the last four weeks or last eight weeks instead. Um, and keeping in mind that, okay, maybe our accuracy uh, going forward might not be as high as before, but at least we're not basing it on a completely different trend. So you still, both as a user and I think also as a developer, you need to know something about the background. What do you think? And I, I see it as if organizations were not doing this work, um, you know, say last year or early in this year, they're going to look at it now, um, and they might use it to do some scenario testing. And so you can do those things like, what if we were to only have half of our staff because they got sick, um, unfortunately. Or if we can't, if our supplier for a particular thing that we have uh, has a delay in their supply chain and we are running out of stock, what happens? We can run these scenarios now with the data that we've had in the past to try to see what the outcome could be and so that we're more prepared for the next thing, um, which unfortunately will happen, but I think people, we, we scrambled at the end to get data um, and to pull these things in, we need to use this in the future um, to figure out how we uh, kind of protect and prevent these things from affecting everybody um, so seriously. So uh, let's see, was there, you know, and there was one other thing, like what's not, what data isn't suitable for forecasting? To me, it's just, some of it is, you're never gonna be able to forecast where there's uh, high, you know, cases of uh, unpredictable things. Um, in the, you know, we couldn't have predicted COVID, for instance, but we can forecast out some other things. Um, do you see anything that's just not suitable at all for forecasting? Yeah, I think any kind of sort of irrational data. I, I did try to input the stock market into into this, and it didn't work uh, neither before COVID or, or after it. So, I mean. Especially in this case, um, in the line chart, uh, if there is a trend and if there is a seasonality to it, it could be, you know, over the day, over the week, over the month, over the quarter or any kind of repeatable pattern, then it's, I think, extra suitable for this kind of forecasting. Um, and perhaps with other forecasting models, we can capture other things as well. But if there's no patterns, well, then there's not so much to forecast. Uh, so you should really be careful looking at you know, false predictions, um, even though, say, a stock market might be going up, don't maybe extrapolate too much on that trend. We did do that, and we put a big disclaimer that um, this is not going to be a prediction of the stock market, but just to show that you could do it. Um, and uh, if we had gotten that right, I think we'd all be um, in quarantine on an island somewhere um, <laughs> with all of our, with our entire company. So that's there. Let's move into, I, know, I saw some questions come in um, while you were going. Okay, clear. Um, is it possible to forecast my month in case I only have monthly data? And you kind of touched on that, that the seasonality doesn't necessarily mean um, 
a whole year worth of data, like all season, it could be seasonal within a week, the day over day, or even hourly can be the seasonality, right? Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't have to be daily. It can be by week, by month, by any kind of time series, at least. So and the more data you have, it's, it's obviously going to factor in, uh, right? So the M yeah, yeah. you talk about, if you only have five data points, a forecast is going to be, uh, it's going to have a high level of air, uh, right? Yeah, correct. Um, a question, I think this one for me, collaborative comments. So is there a limit on what people can see and who can add comments? Uh, absolutely. Uh, using VisLib collaboration, um, you can set up rules and actually workflows so that certain people can create comments and then another group can approve those comments and make those available to a wider group. Uh, they can also be uh, limited to the selections that are made. So uh, if you remember back, I was looking at some different regions. We might hide the comments for a particular region from people that are in another region. And so they only see their relevant comments. And that is something that um, Visible Collaboration has the ability to, uh, to set that up with your data. And so there's a lot of kind of different use cases around there. There's no limits on the number of people or how many comments you have. Uh, often the organizations that uh, deploy this, uh, deploy it behind their firewall in their own uh, you know, data center, and they own the database where all those comments are stored. So it's a very, uh, it should be a secure database like you would secure any other sensitive data because people are talking about the information within your company. But you own that complete database um, and can use that and secure it as you see fit. Um, knowing that, uh, I'll put you on the spot here, Daniel, with uh, Click Business Cloud and Click Cloud Services, I believe Climber is doing a lot and has done a lot of work with deploying Click in the cloud, things like Kubernetes and things like that, that it's just a word that I know, but um, I know that our extensions, our products do work with the cloud. Um, yeah. Have you worked since with I think, uh, Yeah, since I think from at least this April release of the uh, Click uh, SaaS software as a service, uh, and also with the Kubernetes uh, on Windows or on cloud, um, all VisLib extensions do work. Um, so if you're a VisLib customer today, um, your same extensions work just as well on-prem, on Windows, on Kubernetes, uh, or in the cloud. And that includes comments and finance and all the other things. Yeah, all of our products, everything that you saw and more are fully tested. Um, we've been working uh, with our own tenants on the Click Business Cloud to also move our solutions over there and, and try some things out. But we've been actively working with Click uh, to get everything uh, working in the cloud. Um, and definitely, that's the easiest way to get started with any of this is to go out, um, if you're new to Click for one, sign up, get a trial, then you can also get the trial for VisLib and put these things in place and start building some uh, things. So everything we showed, including collaboration, is available for a trial. Um, let me move to my next screen. I know we're getting close there. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to go out to vislib.com, lots of good information there, and then just download the products and you can put them in your ClickSense environments, whether it's on your desktop for kind of testing things out into your enterprise deployment or on the cloud. And we do have a, uh, I put a little breaking news thing because we don't have enough breaking news as is, uh, with VisLib right back being a new feature that we're going to be launching in May. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions about that. So wanted to note that we're right on the, uh, the turning point for that one. So stay tuned and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions about that or maybe want to get a sneak peek. Uh, with that, uh, I don't see many more questions coming in, but our, our contact information, uh, easiest way to get to us is through climber.se or vislib.com. And uh, you can find me and Daniel on LinkedIn as well and connect to us there if you'd like. And uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thanks Stay a lot, Daniel. Out there. Yep, you too. Take care, everybody. Bye.